the only way we can truly learn something uh, is by trying to become someone who has already learned it or learned it. So don't strive to learn physics. Strive to become a person who has learned physics. Greetings, this is Eugene the Philosopher, the greatest living philosopher after the unfortunate passing of Quentin Robert de Nameland, who has been the greatest living philosopher before me. So, I'm going to talk about a powerful method of working with knowledge that you can apply pretty much right now to anything you are concerned with, starting from what am I going to eat for dinner today, to where I should invest my money in, or what should I study, what, what artistic decision I should make, in my new musical album or whatever or business decision things like that so it might look pretty general the way I'm gonna describe it but really it works practically and as Ludwig Boltzmann has put it uh, there's nothing more practical than a good theory you know so let's start uh, the main thing I'm gonna talk about is what I call explication all right so what is explication? It's, it is to describe exactly and as clearly as possible what you think about something. So let's say you have a certain problem. Again, examples described above, right? So you try to describe an, as exactly and as clearly as possible what you think about it. Uh, about some object or some problem or some person or some relationship of you with that person, etc., etc. Uh, it should be written down again, either in like in written form, or you may do it actually in spoken form. Like you may record yourself giving a speech about it, like just talking all the things you think about it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, in written form, it's probably the easiest because it's the again easiest to navigate at the very least, right? In with the current way you know we work with the media etc but perhaps again if you're an artist uh, and you're seeking for some inspiration like you're working on some completely new project uh, you might use whatever means accessible to you like music or graphics or whatever else but again written form is probably the easiest uh, but it's not limited to it. Like really, the only limitation is that this thing should be external to your body, let's say. It should be outside of your imagination. Again, explicated, as the title says, right? It should be written down, spoken out, spoken out, uh, drawed out, so to speak, or sang, singed out, or played out on musical instruments, etc., etc. Uh, this requirement is there in order to uh, make sure that, uh, let's say, uh, well, you might have what I call implied knowledge. Like, you may think you know something, right? But uh, this process is there to exactly get rid of your view of this illusion of knowing, right? Because you may actually not know this, or you may actually know more than you think, etc., etc. So you have to, again externalize it in some way with respect to your imagination at least again it might be an essay or a short story or an assortment of facts or whatever uh, you come up with right it should be some database roughly speaking some raw stuff you know uh, so again you have to be as clear and honest as possible here and make it as complete as possible so there may be things that you think uh, like are a bit extreme so you are you may be afraid to even speak out or write out something so this is another thing why we need to externalize it all right so you might have uh, quite a bit of self moderation especially if we're talking about relationships with people right uh, so you have to like you know act as if you are drunk in some way you know uh, that people say uh, you might actually be drunk if uh, I mean if you're into it then by all means but it's not like I'm recommending it necessarily but people say in vino veritas you know uh, the, the truth is in the wine but what what it actually means is that a drunk person doesn't really care about the consequences of what they're saying right so if you want to know the truth uh, I mean, uh, the the actual opinion of a person, you should look, uh, hear them talking when they're drunk, right? Something like that. 
So you have to be this drunk person in this case, right? Not necessarily as mentally impaired as a drunk person, I mean, uh, intellectually, but uh, in the sense of honesty, right? That's what I'm saying. Or you might be, for example, not too sure about some things. Uh, you still have to write it all out, all right? You have to explicate all of that. Uh, and uh, one uh, sort of uh, helping hand in this regard is that you don't have to share it with anybody, right? It's your own internal working, if you wish, on this whatever problem you have. Uh, and uh, that's a caveat I'll return to near the end of this video, all right? So you have to leave all the doubts aside and just be true to, us, to yourself and be assertive about your opinions, right? Uh, even if they're wrong. In fact, most likely quite a bit of them are going to be wrong. And as you externalize them, as you sort of trust this piece of paper with them, something like that, you will see that this looks kind of weird. That's, this is not what I kind of really think, right? You kind of want to get it back, but you can't. It's already there, right? So that's another important uh, thing. Like, again, all of the naive, you know, uh, things uh, need to be weeded out. All of these, uh, you know, like um, implicit, like, again, this implied knowledge is, is kind of a false knowledge in a lot of cases, right? So we're, we're using this lens of this piece of paper that you're going to use to write it all out to, to actually look at them, to document them, to document these mistakes that you may have, that you may make internally to correct them externally, actually uh, enact this in the real world, potentially, in the end, right? So, yeah, it all should be documented. On the other hand, uh, you will quickly find out that you actually know much, much more about the thing or a problem or whatever you're working with, uh, on than you've ever imagined. So, now another requirement would surface, and that is that you have to stay focused on the like exact issue that you're trying to solve with this process, uh, and not to be buried in you know the endless array of uh, unimportant factoids or uh, again like irrelevant side notes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because uh, as we've said multiple times on this channel, uh, any object is inherently a network. Right, and it's an infinitely large network, so you can chase all the separate branches of this network almost infinitely, right? So you might start from a very small thing and end up like describing the whole universe, roughly speaking, which is not what you want because you want to solve a particular problem, right? So you have to retain some focus, you have to actually willingly cut some of these branches uh, and leave only the important ones. Uh, so, what does that mean? It means that you actually have to decide what is important and what is not. And I'm going to repeat that. You have to decide. So, it's an act of will. Uh, it's your personal responsibility to make this decision with all the associated risks. Risks associated with the responsibility and the decision, right? But it is, it is also a very creative stage of this work where you make these decisions of what to keep and what to throw out, what to stay focused on and what to ignore, like what could be important and what is probably not important, all right? Like here actually there is a possibility of a feedback loop. So if you progress through this process, as we're going to talk about like in a minute, and, and you find out that you're at a dead end, like nothing seems to make any sense, you have to get back here uh, to this stage and say, well, maybe we've missed something important. Maybe we've thrown out some of the facts that were actually important. And we have just didn't notice them or didn't consider them as being important, right? Like if your relationship with some person have broken down for some reason, you may start remembering, oh, actually... Uh, they've actually said this to me once and I've just completely ignored it. I thought it's like an unimportant detail. But then as you like work everything out, you, you figure out, well, actually, that was a big thing. You know, this whatever 
personal trait was really important for them and I thought it wasn't, etc., etc., you know. So there is a definite possibility for a feedback loop for certain troubleshooting in this process of explication that we're talking about, right? So in science, this is what we call analysis. The process of determining what is important and what is not, right? What, what should we keep uh, as relevant info and what we should discard as unimportant facts. But it's also obviously important in creative activity because any sort of creative activity relies on some sort of optics, on some sort of focus, on some sort of emphasizing of certain acts, accentuation, you know, articulation, etc., etc. So, yeah. Um, then, when you have all of it written down, uh, all of this database of facts, and uh, again, you've cut cut out probably all the unimportant stuff. So you like you've said, okay, that's enough. What I've written, like it may be like uh, one large piece of paper. It may be like uh, ten pages long, or but but that's enough. I think it contains everything that could possibly be important. All right. Um, so when you have that, when you have your draft. You look at it and you have to uh, do two additional steps. So step one is you look at these atomic facts, so to speak, that you have, and you try to establish connections between them. You try to establish patterns. You, you may say, okay, this uh, little fact uh, that I know about this thing may be connected to, to this little fact that I know about this thing. So together they create a sort of a sub-network. They, they form like a, like a node in, in, in the overall network of our problem, all right? Something like that. So that's step one, identifying these connections, identifying sort of like a larger nodes in the network. And step two is make generalizations on top of the, those, on top of those patterns that you, uh, that you've noticed. So roughly speaking, you notice a pattern, you notice that some of these atomic facts sort of dance together, in a weird rhythm, so to speak, and then you try to make a generalization on top of them. And this is what is called induction in science, right? Or in logic, right? Well, in science in general. So we say, okay, this stone has weight, this stone has weight, uh, uh, then maybe all the stones have weight, right? That's a reasonable generalization that you can make. And this is how new hypotheses are introduced. This is how scientific theories are forged. This is how new knowledge is acquired, essentially. Uh, and you can implement this for your own sake anytime, pretty much, right? This is how I craft most of my ideas, right? I'm trying to sniff generalizations pretty much everywhere. And in any of my videos, you'll find at least one such generalization, sometimes more than one, actually but not always, uh, some sort of overarching concept, and I usually give them fancy titles, right? So, yeah. So, yeah, you might say, for example, well, like, your issue that you're working on is finding a new, new job, right? Or leaving this job that uh, is not satisfying for you. So, in your draft, you say, well, okay, my main requirement for a job is that I don't work over time, and it is really close to my home. These are two at atomic facts, if you wish. And you notice a pattern between them, like they might be connected, they probably are. And you might generalize them in such a way that, for example, you might say, well, I'm lazy, you know. And you might form a hypothesis, well, I'm not really motivated to work hard and be, you know, this achiever type, sort of. I'm more of a content person. I prefer like a modest and silent uh, lifestyle. I mean, it's uh, totally okay. And the last process of explicate, um, the last, last part of the process of explication that we're talking about is where you arrive at conflicting hypotheses. So this is where real changes are made. This is where things like scientific revolutions happen. This is where some radical changes to lifestyle happen, you know, the proverbial personal growth uh, and things like that, like actual 
I'm not talking about you know the the, the self help uh, um, obsession, etc., etc. So inventions of new artistic genres are created here, etc., etc. So here another choice should be made. So this is another place where you have to utilize your own will and actually to a much larger capacity than previously when we talked about this creative analytical stage, all right? So, for example, uh, we're talking about com conflicting hypotheses, right? So, for example, you might have one hypothesis uh, following from your draft is that I want to be rich, all right? You may have another hypothesis from your draft uh, is that, well, uh, I'm actually like uh, content and prefer a more honest, uh, a more like silent, you know, lifestyle, more modest lifestyle, let's say, right? So these are conflicting hypotheses, right? They don't really go well together. I mean, unless you... Uh, also believe in magic and want to conjure like a ton of gold for yourself, right? And also believe in magic that you won't be robbed afterwards, right? Like, you get the idea, right? So basically, these conflicting hypotheses, like, what is required now is your active willing decision. Uh, and again, in a much pure and raw form, uh, then at the analysis stage, like you may have all kinds of conflicting hypotheses. And in fact, like you might make a generalization here uh, that uh, the problem that you're facing is that you haven't yet, you already have conflicting hypotheses in your uh, problem because, well, that's why you have a problem, you know. You have these conflicting hypotheses, but you have to explicate them to be able to see that you have an in internal conflict that you need to solve somehow, all right? So you may have all kinds of uh, conflicting hypotheses like that, like Earth's mantle must be solid in order to uh, transfer shear waves, right? Shear deformations, as follows from, or apparently follows from seismic data, but it also should be liquid in order to sustain convective motions, as follows from the plate tectonic theory. So these are two contradicting hypotheses and you can't have both. I'm sorry, but you can't. You are bullshitting yourself. You are engaged in wishful, magical thinking and it is impractical, delusional and would eventually lead to a disaster, a catastrophe, a horrible disappointment. All right? So, ultimately, you have to make a decision at this stage, right? You have to, roughly speaking, you know, as in this uh, stupid uh, proverb that you have two wolves, a good one and a bad one, and the one that you feed wins. Basically, that's, that's kind of the choice that you have. You may try to make a super hyper somersault and develop a third hypothesis which would in a non-conflicting manner, include both of those two. Like, again, if I become a wizard and um, create a ton of gold out of nowhere, right? But that's probably the only way you can solve this issue without actually following one, like, making a choice. Like, again, putting your will into it and saying, okay, this hypothesis sucks. In order to solve my problem, I need to actually get rid of this hypothesis. It's actually harmful to me. And like, okay, like I'm willingly choosing another one and following it. And just make that decision and go with it, right? Okay. So that's probably the main point of this video and the main content thereof. So ultimately, we've considered the process of working with knowledge whether it's uh, personal, scientific, aesthetic knowledge, uh, like some sort of business knowledge, etc., which I simply call explication, all right, this process. Uh, even though, if we are being honest, uh, only the very first part of this process could be genuinely called explication, right, when we're 
uh, unfolding our knowledge on a piece of paper, something like that, right? externalizing it. Uh, but as we also remember, some work on top of it is required. Like we have, we need to have analysis to actually stop building up our da database at some point because it's potentially infinite. We have to have uh, some sort of creativity, again, to, for example, recognize the patterns within the, the established uh, array of facts. Then we need to practice induction to make generalization on top of these recognized patterns. And then we need a solid punch of will at the end to actually get rid of a uh, harmful hypothesis, let's say, and uh, choose the one that we actually willingly want to pursue, right? So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the big caveat that I've mentioned uh, near the beginning is that uh, it's the work, explication, that is, this process that I've just described, that you should do on your own, right? It's not something fit for uh, a dialogue of normal human beings, if you know what I mean. Like, it's more of a laboratory practice, uh, a writer's drawer, uh, something that happens, you know, behind the scaffolding, all right? Uh, it's only applicable for sharing maybe between some, like, very close friends, uh, if, we're, if we're talking about, like, uh, interpersonal relationships, or uh, family members, uh, well, again, that depends on your situation, obviously. Or, uh, uh, again, like some sort of scientists or business people who are working on a certain problem and trying to solve it together, right? Um, and again, uh, you have competition in these realms, so you have to choose carefully which people you share such information with in the first place, so yeah. But again, it's applicable to, to everything, but you should probably limit uh, the, the amount of people who are familiar with this draft of yours to a maximum. Like, I mean, uh, the less people know, the better, basically, right? So, uh, in terms of actual human social interactions, uh, you should never explicitly use that, pun intended. So it would look weird, right? There is this principle called demonstrate, do not explicate, which is literally contains the, the, the title of uh, our process in itself, right? So it's uh, contained in uh, Robert Greene's book, 48 Laws of Power, which I recommend you again. It's in Law 9, even though the law is named, uh, titled as something different, but it, it does mention, demonstrate, do not explicate, all right? So, in the process of human interactions, when we're talking about seduction, for example, like, uh, not necessarily sexual seduction, by the way, it could be like political, business, artistic, like, again, you're, you're trying to collaborate with some other great musician, or you're trying to recruit an employee, or you're trying to uh, get political support, it's all seduction, right? But sexual seduction fits here as well, right? So in all of these interactions, a lot of things are not said, but are just uh, subtly introduced by some small, let's say, comments, like casual mentionings of something, like, you know, just like everyday practice basically so so you just demonstrate that you are this kind of person that you're a cool guy someone that they they would like to co cooperate with rather than some schmuck you know so yeah uh like even the way you walk even the way you hold a cup of coffee all of that can work to demonstrate the the quality of you as a person right uh, but you don't say, I'm a cool person. I mean, you might say it in, in a sort of like a ironic way. I, I actually, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very long discussion, but you, hopefully you get the idea. Like, it's futile saying it because it actually sounds uh, false almost, right? It's almost like you're lying because, well, a really cool person wouldn't have to say that they're a cool person. They're kind of cool and everybody knows that and everybody's aware of that already, right? Uh, if you know what I mean. So, the, like, the food doesn't tell you that it's tasteful and it smells good. It, j it just is tasteful and it smells good. And you know that, right? The food doesn't say it to you, right? Uh, in fact, 
if the food is trying to say to you that it's tasteful and smells good, uh, like an analogy you can bring up here is that it, it has some sort of, you know, artificial, uh, whatever, colorizers and uh, chemical additives that make it taste better than it actually does, in which case, again, it's a lie, you know, it, it's actually worse than it pretends to be. So the same is true for human interactions as well. So these subtle hints uh, of, of, again, demonstrating, not explicating, uh, create the illusion, or for a better word, appearance of power, uh, even if there is none. So it's when you achieve more with less, essentially, right? But uh, that's what, the, in a nutshell, what a power is, right? Achieve more with, to achieve more with less, the leverage. The imbalance between the amount of stuff that you do and the amount of consequences it leads to, right? You sign up a piece of paper, a small contract, and a huge industry starts working differently because of that. It means you probably have a lot of power. With a small movement of pen, you make uh, a million of people work differently, for example, right? change schedules, like maybe change jobs, move cities, etc., etc. So you have a huge goddamn impact on humanity, right? Actually. Or in uh, extreme cases, you might say, you know, you, you snap your fingers and you create the, the whole universe or you destroy the whole universe, you know, the, the proverbial Thanos snap, etc., uh, etc. Et so... Uh, that's the principle I'm talking about, well, obviously not to such an extreme degree, but yeah, it's demonstrate, not explicate. You're not saying, I'm so powerful, you just sign the contract and that's all, right? You just uh, walk in a very confident manner and people think, well, you're probably a confident person, right? You don't have to say, I'm a confident person, everybody can see that already, right? Uh, so, be the embodiment of an idea, rather than a face, uh, faceless mouthpiece for it. Right? Uh, it's especially true if you want to teach somebody something. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, we're still apes, right? Uh, so, and what apes do, they parody. Uh, so, the only way we can truly learn something uh, is by trying to become someone who has already learned it, or learned it. So don't strive to learn physics, strive to become a person who has learned physics. Okay, this video is essentially uh, me discussing some aspects of how knowledge works, and the process that I call explication, that is how you actively work with your knowledge, a lot of which you probably didn't even suspect you have, all right? Uh, yet, uh, it's probably as close, the video that is, to a motivational video that we'll ever get on this channel, all right? Thank you for watching. The eons are closing! <laughs>